Good morning, everybody. Uh, Brad Gatto here. Matt Stahl, good morning. <laughs> How are you guys? We actually decided to come to you from the same computer today with the same shirt. So <laughs> there you go. Um, twinsies, as Jen That's just right. called That's us. Just uh, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. If you could, as always, jump in the chat box and uh, say good morning. It just lets me know that you can hear us, uh, that you can see us, and uh, that we're good to go. So if you want to jump in the bottom of the screen in that chat box in the bottom, uh, good morning. Thank you for letting me know that you can hear us. Uh, also, the chat box is always your place to ask questions because although you can see both Matt and I and you can hear us, we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. So your friendly reminder that if you want to talk to us, uh, you absolutely can. It's going to be through that chat box. Feel free to ask questions as we go through our content for today. Uh, today's Inner Circle Workshop, if you have no idea what you signed up for, is about uh, do you have IT, ITT, do you have investment, tax, and time diversification as it relates to your overall financial plan? And so we're going to discuss those three things. And as always, our format is through our fun and friendly quiz. And so if this is your very first Inner Circle Workshop, uh, we're really happy to have you here and glad that you decided to join us today from a flow perspective uh housekeeping items up front we're going to take a little quiz together again it's a fun and friendly quiz it's not it's not graded at least on an individual level we may uh, judge you but <laughs> um well hi you're an admin courtney there you go look at that we just got uh photo bombed in our <laughs> are you gonna stay with us there she goes <laughs> Uh, and then we're just going to walk through those questions together and go through the correct answers to the quiz and why those are the correct answers and kind of give some color. But before I get into all of that, good morning, everybody. Thank you for jumping in the chat box. I appreciate it. Uh, as always, I want to walk through kind of what is going on at Fiat right now uh, and take you through our website and let you know what's coming up so that you have uh, a clear understanding of uh, what you have the op, you know, the additional opportunities that you have to join us for education, things of that nature. So here's our website. If you've never been to our website, fiatwm.com, you can see that at the top of the screen. Uh, there's multiple tabs here of where we can provide education. Where'd my mouse go? Oh, now we're looking at something different. There we go. Uh, so there's the website. Uh, under the education tab here, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you to uh to learn if i scroll down there is a blog i don't know if any of you out there are reading our blog uh how many of you are reading our blog but we do put a blog post out every week uh and so like this last week six tips for combining your finances successfully so <laughs> maybe you've been married for 50 years and you still haven't figured this out how to combine your finances successfully maybe that's for you uh if you've got kids uh that are are getting married and or grandkids and you want to uh to give them some tips and tricks that is there um but there's all kinds of different things all the way down to cheeseburgers are paradise uh that's one of my favorite <laughs> blog posts uh from fiat our very own ashley milo wrote that article she is a a cheeseburger connoisseur yes that's uh, of right sorts right. <laughs> and at the end of the day if you're going to live an everyday a saturday type lifestyle which is what we promote uh you better be able to find the best cheeseburger in town and so that's a fun one but that's under the education tab is our blog also under the education tab is our podcast and I think I already have this pulled up. I do. So we release two episodes every single month, uh, every other Wednesday, I believe. Yep. And actually today is the release of a podcast episode. And so if you missed the one from two weeks ago, it's right here. It's called Chasing Your Values. Uh, I actually interview Matt in this one. And we have a lot of fun because if you are part of the Fiat family and you actually open and read your emails that you get from us <laughs> and pay attention to the communication, you'll know that there was a structural ownership change in Fiat and uh, kind of a role change for Matt. And so I interviewed Matt to talk to him about uh, basically why he made that decision. So that was a fun episode. So listen to that. And then we uh, released one this morning called Don't Poke the Bear Market. Uh, obviously, the markets haven't exactly been super awesome or kind recently. And so we thought it timely to kind of talk about that, talk about what's going on in the future, not the future, but the history the history of bear markets and kind of how this fits in contextually. So I'll go ahead and check that out as well. And then if I go back to the page here, events, uh, we do happy hours every single month. And just so that you know, if you click this button right here, you can register yourself to come to our happy hours. The June happy hour this month is actually tomorrow. So if you have a hankering to come sit on a rooftop patio and have a cocktail with us, we actually now, Matt, have our own signature cocktail here at Fiat. We do, we, uh, we voted on this. What was what is it? So it is a uh, old fashioned. 
a version of an old fashioned. Do you know? Do you know specifically what the difference is? Do you remember? I do not. Putting you on the, the spot. Difference. I do not remember the difference. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, it's an orange rosemary. There we go. I knew, it was, I knew it was an herb of some sort. A herb. Herb. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a herb in it. Uh, it's actually very, very good. And delicious. so that's going to be the, the standard cocktail served at our happy hour. So that will be there tomorrow. Uh, and in July, mark your calendars right now, Thursday, July 21st. I can guarantee that's going to be a, a wonderful sunny day. Yes. Because that's the only month in Minnesota we get that <laughs> it's consistently nice outside. Uh, and then also inner circle workshops. If I click on this in our website, you're going to be able to see that next month, the July inner circle workshop uh, is Wednesday, July 27th. And we're going to go through understanding market volatility. Now, Matt, most people assume volatility is just kind of what we're dealing with right now, that kind of the downs of the market. Right. But volatility is actually also defined by up markets can be considered volatile, um, depending on kind of the movement. And volatility is actually something that can be measured uh, and it's tracked and it affects a lot of things. And so that's what the next month in a circle workshop is going to be on. So from a housekeeping perspective, I think that's all I had. Did I miss anything? Can you think of anything? Uh, I have one thing you don't like to talk about very often, but <laughs> Brad has a book coming out, coming up. Uh, I do. We actually are getting close enough where, and I'm going to put Jen on the spot, who's not even on the screen, but I, it's somewhere between like August 9th and August 16th. We finally have a launch date for the book. Awesome. So. It only took a year and a half. It was really simple. I Super easy. <laughs> super simple. All of you should just write books. It's the best and easiest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, but sometime in August. So that's kind of exciting. Thanks for bringing that up again, Matt. And last but not least, uh, every month, if you are unfamiliar, we draw a random name for somebody that follows us on social media. And we give away a $20 Amazon gift card just for following us around on the internet. Nobody else pays you to follow you around on the internet, do they? You get, uh, they just ding you with not, ads not and you to spend of. money. <laughs> uh, Jake Shower, is that how you would pronounce that last that's name? That's how I pronounce it. That's yeah. What, that's where we're going to go with. Jake, you're the winner this month. Uh, Sorry, Jake, we mispronounced your last name. <laughs> so thank you for following us around on social media. If you don't know how to follow us around on social media, uh, that's these buttons up here on the website. That's Facebook. That's the Facebook logo. Uh, when is it going to change to Meta? I don't know. That's I don't know. A great question. Instagram, I believe that is YouTube uh, and LinkedIn. And actually, our YouTube channel has been updated recently. So if you've not gone to our YouTube channel, if you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel, just so that you know, every podcast episode, I'm going to bring this up so that stop this so that we can be bigger. Every podcast episode we've done over the probably the last maybe ten or twelve. 10 to 12, yeah, podcast Yeah, episodes. we actually started recording not just the audio of the podcast, but a video. So like every podcast, you can just watch on YouTube if you would rather do that. And we've put out some other videos and things like that. So if you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel, um, I would do so because we actually revamped it and it's there's actually usable content out there now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so all that being said, we are going to jump into our fun and friendly quiz for the day. And uh, again, if you're a regular attender, you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. And I want to remind you if this is your first ever Inner Circle Workshop, do not put any pressure on yourself. If you don't know the answers to these questions, it's totally fine. This is just an easy way for us to uh, to get through the content and as we see it, have it not be as boring. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to pull this up. When I pull it up, my screen is going to go dark and we're going to be mute. Normally we play music for you. We realized we started posting these on YouTube. There's copyright issues. <laughs> so we can't do music no anymore. Beatles. So when it goes, yeah, when it goes quiet, we're not gone. We're just giving you time to take the quiz. We normally give about five minutes. So go ahead. I'm going to pull this up right now. Uh, launching poll as we speak. All right. Have fun. We'll be back.
All right, I'm back. The poll is still up. I'm going to give you about five to 10 more seconds. If you are not done yet, uh, go ahead and get finished up and submit. Uh, it sounds like we had a person or two having a problem trying to get submitted. Is Brad left handed? <laughs> it's not <up> there. <laughs> uh that's that's very uh uh observant observant yes that's the word i was looking for i was gonna say astute which is not well also could be that too um tom i did not hit my thumb with a hammer but, but he is left-handed i am left-handed that's uh nice observation <laughs> especially if the camera's flipped you know right. a lot of times it's not the right yeah. anyway um <laughs> no i was i was cutting vegetables and um <laughs> Uh, I cut more than the vegetable. We'll just say that. Uh, I missed. Um, all right, here we go. I'm going to end the poll and we're going to get rocking here. End poll. All right, results are in. Let me share the results. We're going to start off with question number one in fiat language. Let's, let's rewind a bit. Can we talk about overall? Fair. Yes. We did say we were going to do that. We're going to give you, I'm going to stop this for just a second. Um, we wanted to give you a little bit of context up front and we normally don't do this. And so I almost forgot. And that's why we have Matt, right? <laughs> um, so we investment time and tax diversification when it comes to kind of overall financial planning for those near retirement or in retirement, all three of these things are vitally important. Uh, and so we just want to give a little context of what they are first before we go through the poll and the specifics. And so uh, investment diversification, I think is the most obvious one. It's the one that everybody understands, right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't buy one individual stock and just kind of hope that company makes it. You have diversification on from an investment perspective on a lot of levels, not just company diversification, but sector diversification, uh, yeah, ge yeah. geographic diversification, uh, and so on and so on. And so there's a lot of different ways to diversify yourself from an investment perspective. Um, Second, time diversification. Uh, to us here at Fiat, we really try to bucket money in three different time frames. Uh, the first, what we call now money, is one to two years. Money that you need in the next 12 to 24 months has a specific goal, and liquidity is the primary objective, and safety is the other primary objective of that pile of money. We need to have stuff that you can spend and deploy immediately and is not at the risk of the markets at the same time. Soon money is money between years three and 10, really. So mm -hmm. not money you need immediately, but not stuff that we have 10 years to let it bake. I'm really um, like self-conscious of my thumb because Tom <laughs> called me out. That's a nice I keep seeing my, yeah, well, this is what happens when you ask your kid to get you a Band-Aid, you get this. Um, thanks, Liam. Uh, so anyway, from a time perspective, if you don't have yet 10 years, we'll get to that in a second. That three to nine year bucket, I would argue in our, planning process, and really for advisors in general, especially given kind of the current state of the bond market, it's the hardest bucket to deal with mm -hmm. uh, because we can't just go full-blown equities, which I'll discuss in a second. It's actually part of the quiz, um, but we also can't be in cash, right? So we've got that soon bucket. And then later money is 10 years plus. And so again, there's quiz questions on kind of what our thought processes are around later money. And then from a tax perspective, also three buckets. We love buckets and there's always three. Uh, so there's pre-tax money, after-tax money, and tax-free money. And at the end of the day, if all of your eggs are in one basket, most of your money's pre-tax, all of your money's after tax, you're kind of making bets on where Congress is going to go relative to taxes, let alone, even if Congress doesn't change anything, you're kind of making a bet on where your cash flow is going to go, because ultimately your 1040 every single year is kind of going to determine what your overall tax bills are going to look like. And so, again, diversification being key, we don't want all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, the average problem that we see for retirees is because of the rise of things like 401ks um, and IRAs and things of that nature, which again are part of the quiz. Most people have most of their money in pre-tax buckets. Absolutely. I think a lot of people assume that uh, adv as advisors, we spend most of our time in that investment diversification. That is, that's what we find the assumption usually is. Uh, this is really about building a framework. We like to, I personally, and I, us, as a whole, like talk about building a framework and organization around all this. So I would, I would actually say our belief is whether it's a financial advisor or any other outside professional, the best asset they have to offer a client is to create that framework and create that organization and bring these three concepts together to create that plan. So yep. it's not necessarily we pick the best mutual fund or 
uh, this thing beat up this thing over here. It's more, what is our overall structure and do we have peace with that? Um, so well said. Well, thanks, Matt, for derailing yes. me out of the poll. And now here we go back <laughs> into the quiz. All right. So question number one was in fiat language, ISR stands for, I love fiat language. <laughs> Matt wrote that question. I love it. Uh, in inflation sustainability ratio is answer A or one or whatever. 10% uh, of you selected that. 65% of you said income stability ratio, 23% investment standards requirement, uh, and 3% indexing strategy rule. So you could argue maybe a tough question because this is our lingo, yeah. kind of. Yep. Um, but also if you're a client of fiat and you don't know this language, that's on us <laughs> um, because you probably should. Uh, the correct answer is the one most of you selected, which is income stability ratio. This comes down to your paycheck in retirement. Income stability ratio is a really fancy way to say how much of your paycheck that you want. Let's just use $10,000 a month because it's an easy number. Uh, and not just looked at this month or this year, but over your entire plan, life expectancy, however you want to look at that from the beginning of retirement to the end of retirement. We'll just put it that way. How much of your paycheck is coming from sources that are guaranteed? Now, those could be kind of group sources like social security, pension plans, things like that. It could be individual sources with things like annuities. But the bottom line is how much guaranteed kind of mailbox money, as we like to call it, do you have coming in the door? And what does that look like from a percentage standpoint? Or what is the ratio of total income need versus guaranteed sources? Uh, that said, one of the reasons we watch it so much is because like everything in life, you can be underinsured and you can be overinsured. And it's a very simple thought process when it comes to like car insurance. I always like that example because it's the most kind of basic uh, commoditized type transaction out there in the insurance world. I know what my car is worth roughly. I know what my deductible is, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and so I know that if I have a thousand dollar deductible, that the first thousand dollars of risk is on me and the rest of it's on the insurance company, not just for my car, but things like bodily injury and things of that nature. But the bottom line is I'm passing off some of that risk to somebody else. Uh, and when it comes to income, you can do the same thing through a pension plan because you don't have any of the risk of running out of money. That's all on the pension plan to make sure that you're covered. Uh, Social Security Administration, some people get far more out of the Social Security Administration than they ever put in as far as their Social Security payments are concerned. Uh, the best example of that is the first person to ever receive Social Security, Ida Mae Fuller, put like $24 into the system and you know, her first check was like $24 and she lived to be like 100. So <laughs> she won big time. Uh, annuities, individual pensions basically is what annuities are or pensions are annuities, however you want to look at that, uh, can create those paychecks. But you can have too much guaranteed income when you look at kind of the law of averages, how the markets play out and, and being able to take some of that risk on yourself. Just like if you bought car insurance with a $0 deductible, your premiums are going to absolutely skyrocket and the risk reward just isn't there anymore. So now if my $60 a month premium, if I take my deductible from $1,000 down to zero, would go to $400, well, what do I get in return for the additional $340 of premium per month? $1,000 of risk off my plate. Well, obviously that's not worth it. And so if you've ever noticed when you bought car insurance, they always kind of suggest between $500 and $1,000 deductible. Because anything less than $500, your premiums just go up too fast. Anything more than $1,000, it doesn't really bring your premiums down that much. So there's kind of this line of efficiency. And so what we look for is income stability ratios, depending on your situation, between 60 and 80%. Um, and again, there's a lot of factors that determine why somebody's good at 60 and other people are good at 80. Just like some people should have a $500 deductible on their car because their cash flow is tight. Or other people who don't have tight cash flow should probably have a $1,000 deductible because they can afford the extra $500 of risk and keep those insurance premiums in their pocket. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, the only thing I would add is I, I wanted to start with this first question, question number one, because it, it, it really gets tying in all the, the three different components yeah. investment time and tax diversification and this is a perfect example of creating a framework and some sort of model and a language that we can use in common with clients and people we talk to to understand how we begin building that framework yep. so all these other things we talk about kind of fall under that big that first heading so all right good point question number two question number two the top performing asset class in 2021 was 61 percent of you selected real estate 10% selected emerging market equity, 23% uh, 
selected large cap equity and 6% selected small cap equity. I love it when we stump people. It's and actually very rare. Yes. They have very smart inner circle workshop attendees. Uh, it's to, very common that we get through an entire quiz and you guys don't miss one. Yeah. But, uh, to be fair, it was very, very close, but the correct answer was large cap equity. So 23% of you did get that correct. This is, this is an example of classic investment diversification. And like I said, this is what most people assume where we spend a majority of our time, but we're going to go through a visual here. If we pull it up. There it is. And this first visual we're going to go through is what's called the Callan periodic table of investment performance. So this company Callan began putting this out. I don't know what year they began, but it's become an annual piece. And some people call this a cult chart. Some will call it a periodic table. I think it's fascinating just to look at the difference over time. And so if we look at, I still have nightmares about chemistry. So, so I, yeah, right. it's not yeah. a periodic table. <laughs> so it's a quilt chart. <laughs> the, uh, so you'll see in 2021, large cap equity was the top performing asset class and real estate was just below that. So large cap equity in 2021 was up 28.71% and real estate was just behind at 26.09%. So very, very, very close. We did stump some people. I don't like to stump people because I want to be mean. I like to stump you because it means you learned something. So, um, but the observation that I would like to look at is just look at large cap equity. So if we just zone in on that one large blue square and you look historically, there's only three times, including last year, that that was actually at the very top. So back in 2015, 2019 and 2021, going back to 2002. This is a perfect example to show why diversification is important. And when you hear, well, oftentimes when you hear that word investment diversification, we will oversimplify, which we're a big fan of making things more simple, but we'll think stocks and bonds. And this does a great job of breaking that down a bit further into, okay, we have stocks, what kind of stocks are those? Are they in the United States? Are they outside of the United States? Yep. Are they larger companies? Are they smaller companies? <clears throat> this shows a perfect illustration of why it's important that we are spread across all those different asset classes because I hate to break it to you, but none of us knows for certain what's going to happen. And if you think that the two of us do, you should you should exit right now. <laughs> so the, uh, um, we have a general educated idea of where these different asset classes are yep. based on how much risk we want to take. And do we have that? that other drill down we do so what's interesting about um oop, i just put my computer to sleep uh u.s equities is one more layer deep into u.s equities would be the growth side of you large u.s equities versus the value side of large U.S. equities. And so these are growth oriented companies versus value companies. Value companies you're typically buying because you want a dividend because you're not expecting the stock price to, to move a lot. A growth company, you're really trying to get, uh, you're really investing in it because you expect the actual price of the stock to move. But if you break it down, yes, large U.S. equities kind of won the day last year. But to give you some perspective, if you just go one layer deeper into growth versus value in 2022, so far year to date, uh, on the U.S. large cap growth side, growth stocks specifically, large U.S. growth stocks, they're down, this is as of end of May, 23.98%, almost 24%. Large U.S. value companies are only down 1.6%. So just grouping them all together does give you some of a picture but understand that you even go one layer deeper on all of a sudden there's this massive divergence in a year like 2022 between just even the growth side and the value side of the exact same u.s large sector and to go back even a couple go back a couple of years in 2020 uh, in 2020 large u.s growth which is getting absolutely hammered this year was up 40 percent in that same year large u.s value was only up two percent so like in 2020, it was the inverse. Growth was amazing, large U.S. growth, amazing value, not as amazing, 2%. Uh, this year, it's the exact opposite. Value is down less than 2%, growth down almost 24%. Again, as of May and June hasn't exactly been a bright spot for the markets either. So uh, it hasn't gotten a lot better. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning uh, in that chart is if you look at 
last year, we would all say the markets were good last year. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. the markets were up, that sort of thing. But there's asset classes on that chart that actually lost money. And so it's not like when we say the markets are up, we're usually talking about things like the S&P 500 index mm -hmm. or the Dow Jones, which all fit into that large U.S. equity category. So, That's all right, fair. let me stop the share here and we will move on to question number three. By the way, uh, I will reiterate in that chat box, if you have questions as we're walking through this, please go into the chat box and ask those questions. All right, question number three, how many folds in a piece of paper would it take to reach? Oh, I got to share the results so you can see. Here we go. How many folds in a piece of paper would it take to reach the moon? Folding in half each time. So taking a regular sheet of paper like this, you fold it in half, it obviously doubles in width. You fold it in half, it doubles again. Fold it in half, it doubles again. How many times do you have to do that before it's thick enough that it reaches the moon? Now, Matt and I both know it's not humanly possible to do it more than seven times. Once you get down to that seventh fold, the piece of paper is too small to fold it in half again. But hypothetically, you could keep doing it. 48% uh, of you answered one point, I'm just gonna say 1.2 million and some change. Okay. Um, 16% of you said 1389, 19% of you said 42, 42 folds, uh, and 16% of you said 48,564. Pretty, you know, the most Even for sure on 1.2 million, but the other three kind of all got a similar amount. Uh, Matt, we we stumped them again, two in a row, yes. two in a row. Yes. The correct answer is 42 times. And the reason we asked this question is because when it comes to time diversification, one of the things you need to understand about time is the value of it. Um, we talked about this in a podcast episode we did recently about the psychology of money. Uh, we talked about Warren Buffett as the example, kind of the key example here that uh, Morgan Housel talks about in that book. The fact that everybody knows Warren Buffett's one of the best investors of all time. He's worth $85 billion or some asinine amount of money. But the vast majority of his net worth came after his 65th birthday. In fact, of his $85 billion net worth as of the time Morgan wrote that book, like 81.4 billion of it came after he was age 65. So the correct answer to this question is 42 folds because the piece of paper you know, doubles in width, the first fold doubles again, doubles again, doubles again, two times two is only four, but times two is eight, times two is 16, then 32, 64, 128, you know, it keeps, the numbers just all of a sudden start to go crazy. And so the value of time is really, really important. It's also really important for retirees to understand, Matt, because when you start saving in your 20s or 30s or whenever it was that you started, and then you, by the time we enter your story, you're 55, 60, 65 years old, and you look at what your money did in the most recent bull market that we had, the last 12 years before 2022, your money doubled, maybe it tripled. Um, for some of you, maybe even a little bit more than that, if you were lucky, the S&P 500 index with dividends reinvested included was up like 500% in that period of time, which actually is not abnormal. We've had bull markets or even almost twice that much. But that said, your money over that time, if you had a million dollars and it doubles, it becomes 2 million. That's awesome and really powerful. But if it ever happened again, all of a sudden that two becomes four. And if it happened again, that four becomes eight and then the eight becomes 16. And so it's those last folds that mean everything. In fact, at 42 folds, to put some perspective to it, at 40 folds, you're not even out of the atmosphere. At 41 folds, you're halfway to the moon. That last fold does half of the work, right? Because it doubles. If you're halfway there and you fold in half, that last half all comes through one fold, whereas that first fold did almost nothing. And so time really matters, which is why when we talk about now money, soon money, and later money, it's really, really important with that later money where we know if we let the, the funds <clears throat> bake for about 10 years, which we're going to get to here in a second, so I'm going to completely steal it, that we've got a really good chance of the equities playing out. And we need that long-term growth of equities to kind of stave off things like inflation and frankly, just to take advantage of the historical growth of equities over time. Yep. Anything you want to add to that? I uh, just, I love this question. Uh, it's, I've, I've heard this question in other contexts outside of this world, outside yeah. of investment world. It just shows as humans, our inability to fathom the power of compounding. And I, so I just, I love it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Question number four. All right. Question number four is the S&P 500 dropped 34% in the span of how many days in early 2020? 52% <clears throat> of you selected 33 days. 
6% selected 162 days, 42% selected two days, and 0% selected 68 days. The correct answer is 33 days. They got it. Uh, so nicely done. Although close. We did not stump you that time, but it was a close, uh, it was close between that and two days. The, the reason that I wanted to go through this is just to give us context. So if we think about historical patterns and things we've observed over time, I think most of us on this, this uh, call are going to remember back in 2008 and nine. Oh. I know both of us certainly do. If you were alive, I'm sure the rest of you do is that as well. And so I think it's important just to recognize as again, as humans, we like to make things simple and break them down into things that we can understand. Yeah. And so oftentimes we'll see these headlines of flash that say S&P 500 is down 50% without the context of what, over what time period is that? And so I just wanted to reiterate from a time diversification standpoint, which would also play into the investment side of things is just understanding that volatility and how it can go up and down and how quickly that can happen. And so 2022, not, not been the greatest year. And if we look at um, U.S. stocks, according to the S&P 500, which we'll use as our index, over 162 days is, was down 22.1% as of June 14th. So 162 days versus significant drop you know, back in 2020 in a matter of 33 days, that just frames how different we can experience this volatility over time. And just to give another frame of reference, back in 2008, so if you remember back in 2008, we had the first kind of series of scares in the fall of 2008, kind of a cooling off period. And then the, then everything kind of fell off the, yeah. the rails at March, 2009 being the bottom. Yeah. And so from October 6, 2008 to October 10th, 2008, the S&P 500 dropped 20% just in that four day timeframe. Again, this just reiterates the importance of having that framework. If we do have the appropriate income stability ratio, if we have the appropriate amount of liquidity or cash on hand, we can, we can weather that drop yeah. and also be observant of how quickly things come back. So going back to the um, 2020, from March 23rd, 2020, when we experienced the, the drop of the 33 days, in 354 days, the S&P 500 doubled in value. And that's a, that's a very short time frame to have something double that quickly. So again, reiterating the importance of a framework, the importance of understanding over time and our investment decisions within there. Yeah, it's uh, the speed of a drop can be very significant to your cash flow. Obviously, if we don't have like a now bucket, we don't have cash to deploy in that period of time. But the other piece of that, Matt, is what happens to people that aren't don't have kind of a framework built is things like March of 2020, things like 2022 year to date can scare people into making decisions they probably shouldn't make and people would have cash. In the short term, you could look at that and like to, like this year, you could have gone to cash in February after a little bit of a drawback. And right now you probably fancy yourself a genius. Um, and in the short term, you're right. The problem is you don't know when to get back in. And you and I talked about in the podcast episode that actually is dropping today, a little bit of a teaser for you, that over a 20 year period from 1998 through 2018, there's two massive pullbacks in the market, the dot-com in 2000, 2001, 2002, pro massive prolonged pullback from a time perspective, one of the longest ones we've had. Uh, and then in 2008, 2009, the largest pullback we've had on a percentage basis since the Great Depression. So two of them in there in that 20 year period. And even though that was the case over that 20 years, the S&P still averaged an annual positive rate of return. But what's crazy is if you miss the best 60 days in the market, so three days a year over a 20 year period, your average return went from a positive five and some change to a negative annual return to like seven and some change. So about a 12 to 13% annual difference every year compounded over a 20 year period, just because you missed the best three days every year in the market. Uh, we can't afford to do that in long-term planning, but we also can't afford to be taking cash out when it's down 30%, which is why this bucketing of money, of having now money, soon money, and later money is, is just so vitally important. Absolutely. So, all right, next question. Share results. We haven't gotten any questions in the chat box yet. 
Oh, we're ready. Are they bored? The, are we boring? Are we just sense. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the matching shirts just lull them to sleep. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Are you guys there? Um, <laughs> all right. If nobody answers, maybe we should just stop because maybe nobody's <laughs> there. We go enthralled. Um, enthralled. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Jeremy kept the inner circle workshop going for the rest of you. Uh, question number five It is always best to put all of your money in a Roth position or Roth IRA. Roth position. Great wording. Uh, true, 3%, false, 97%. Uh, you guys nailed it. 97% of you nailed it. Uh, it is not good to put all of your money in one bucket. So coming back to diversification from a tax perspective, remember there's also three buckets. We've got the pre-tax bucket, the after-tax bucket, and the tax-free bucket. And at the end of the day, there, <laughs> certain, there are certain situations and very few clients that we actually do move almost exclusively into Roth buckets. But for a lot of other people, the majority of people we don't one because we don't know where congress is going to go i think we all have kind of a, a general idea of what's probably going to happen to taxes in the future but it's still a guess right it's kind of like the markets like i have a general idea of what's going to happen based on a lot of these factors but still at the end of the day we don't really know and so you want to have money in all buckets one of the primary reasons as an example to leave money behind in an ira is because there is wiggle room in the tax code to every for everybody to have some income some taxable income that won't be taxed because we all get standard deductions. And so you don't want to be one of those people where through, let's say the only guaranteed source of income you have is social security, but your social security is not enough to get you through the standard deduction. Well, you could bring in taxable income on top of that, maybe 10, 20 grand a year and still not pay any taxes. Whereas if you convert all that to Roth, you're going to pay taxes on the entire thing. And so for somebody in a situation like that, we have to, for sure, leave some IRA money behind because we can get it out of there tax free. There are, it is possible to be able to pull money out of an IRA and pay no tax, depending on what your 1040 looks like. And so you don't want all of your money in a Roth, one, because we don't know what Congress is going to do. And two, because you could be one of those people that putting money, taking money out of an IRA today and putting it into a Roth could actually be detrimental, not beneficial. And so we need to make sure that we have money in the different buckets. And then there's that weird bucket in the middle, that after-tax bucket. And this is, the, <laughs> this is the bucket that gets everybody. This is the hardest bucket to deal with. It's kind of like the middle bucket in the time. The, the now bucket's yeah. obvious. Uh, yeah. You know, we got a cash and cash equivalents. It's got to be liquid. It's got to be safe. The later bucket, actually kind of simple. I want equities. I need low cost, you know, passive keep me in equities, that kind of position, that middle bucket is kind of a bummer because it's hard to manage. Mm -hmm. The middle bucket from a tax perspective is also kind of a bummer because that, that non-qualified after-tax bucket, uh, there's just a lot of nuance to it. Um, this is this could get very like, we should get the Chase Lounge out. I'm a middle child and I now I'm starting to realize <laughs> that maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe this is why I have so many problems. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know how I got, why did my brain go there? Um, this middle bucket, this non-qualified bucket is it's after tax money and it grows taxable, but it's a different set of tax rules. And there's different rules around like step up and cost basis. Uh, you can maybe pass the money to the next generation without them having to have a tax bill. Just a lot of nuance to it. And it's the bucket that Congress is kind of after the most relative to change because they consider this bucket for rich people, quite frankly, because the average non-rich person, as the IRS would define it, only has money in like a 401k if they have any money saved at all. And so it's only people that have gone above and beyond the traditional retirement accounts that are throwing money here. And so we just have to be cognizant of it's good to have some money there because there are times where that middle bucket, that after tax taxable investment bucket, even the taxable portion, the growth could still be tax free because the first tax bracket is zero. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's pretty awesome. And so if your income is low enough on your 1040, all the growth of that bucket could be a 0% tax rate. And there's a step up in basis at death. Uh, in other words, it could be that your beneficiaries get that money tax-free. There's just a lot of different areas where that might be the best option for people. So again, outside of just diversifying the investment side of things, we need to make sure that you have the appropriate amount of money in each tax bucket. And there is no correct answer of how much money should be in pre, post, and free relative to your situation, there's a correct answer, but there isn't like a blanket answer for everybody. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that? Do you, do you happen to have the tax foundation historical chart pulled up on your computer? 
uh i don't know that i well maybe i do <clears throat> i will check and see here matt the uh only reason i wanted to, to pull that up to see if we have it is this, this is that is it yeah okay i'm going to share my screen i found it all right this is a this is a simple it's from the tax foundation it's just a historical marginal tax chart I think this is fascinating just to give us perspective and tax cuts and if, if you've talked to us you've heard us talk about TCGA over and over again tax cuts and jobs act that's yep. the tax atmosphere that we find ourselves in now. Um, so often you hear us talking about how it is likely beneficial to move something into a Roth position not all, not everybody but. We may go into this just this is taking back taking us back to 1980 and it'll show. You know, in 1980 dollars, the top marginal tax bracket at a federal level is 70 percent. And now we think about we just looked up. We looked had up, been that for a while. Yeah, and we looked up Minnesota from 1965 <laughs> till 1980. 1980, and we look up Minnesota, and that was close to 10 percent. And there was payroll tax that had existed then, just as it does now. Um, of course, these the the dollar numbers don't match up to today, but just to give an example that 59% tax bracket, if you made the equivalent of about $300,000 a year. So right here on the left-hand side of the screen where you see it says we're under nominal where it says 59%, it says over $85,000 of income, but not over 109. So if you fell in 1980 between 85 and 109, uh, you would have been taxed at the 59% rate on those dollars. Matt's point is if you inflation adjust that, that gets you to how much income today? About 300,000, somewhere okay. in that range. Yeah. So just comparison perspective, but it, it, if nothing else, it just gives us perspective on how low of an income tax environment we are in right now. And as we're thinking through decisions to be aware of that. Yeah. So again, to kind of finish off kind of that thought process in 1980, <clears throat> if you had $300,000 of income inflation adjusted for today's numbers, uh, your federal rates, 59%, you got payroll taxes of a little over 7%. And if you lived in the state of Minnesota, where we live at that time, you'd have been paying about 10%. And so, um, about 75% of those dollars would be gone to taxes at that point. We wouldn't see that today. <laughs> so can you, it'd be hard to want to go to work knowing that 75 cents of every dollar that you earn is not yours. It's hard enough now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. All right. Question number six. All right. Historically, if you have one year to keep your money in the S and P 500 index, what percent do you have of losing money? So 42% of you selected 9.4%, 23% when, when there's two percentages, this gets 23% <laughs> of you selected 19.8%, 19% of you selected 26.3% and 16% of you selected 50%. We, we stumped them again. Yeah, we're we're, we're on a roll. We're today. killing it. Today. Yes, the, you uh, guys normally beat us. We're beating you today. <laughs> You're learning. That's, <laughs> that's what's important here. The, no, uh, it's important that we win. <laughs> <laughs> so the correct answer is twenty six point three percent. So nineteen percent of you selected that. And Brad's going to pull up a chart here just to give us some uh, context. So the S and P five hundred or the Standard and Poor's five hundred is an index. There we go. Up uh, today of 500 companies make up that particular index. That's actually been around since 1926, but back then it was only 90 stocks. It wasn't 500 until 1957. 1957, yeah. So the index is about 100 years old, but it doesn't. It didn't exist as it does today, S&P 500 until 1957. Yep. So this chart that Brad just pulled up for us, this shows over a time period of one year. So January 1st, we're putting our chunk of money in. We're gonna let it ride till December 31st. And we're taking it all out. Which, there's, yep. Which there's likely would not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> no. But the, uh, but over a one year time frame, we have a 26.3% chance of actually losing money over that time frame. So what you'll see is this chart goes down further. If that 10 year mark that's highlighted in yellow, beyond that point, if we plan to leave that money set for 10 years plus, that drops to a 4.7% 4 chance of losing money over that time frame. Um, Another way to say that is a 95% chance you're gonna make money. Right. And even if you lost money, as you can see there in the range of annualized returns, 
the worst case scenario ever for rolling one year, you know, 10 year periods every day, 10 years forward, every day, 10 years forward, rolling 10 year periods uh, was a loss of 1.4%. But what's interesting about that too, Matt, is that if you just look at it from 1957 till more recent till today, which is when the S&P 500 became the 500 stocks, not the 90 stocks, yep. uh, it's not a 95% chance you're going to make money. It's closer to about 99% chance you're going to make money. Um, but if you look at the one year period to the point of the question, there's about a 75% chance you're going to make money and a 25% chance that you're not going to make money. And if you look at the range of annualized returns, the worst case scenario in a one year period is a 43% loss. Best case scenario is a 54% gain in any one year in the S&P. Uh, that's just too big of a deviation for people to stomach from a cash flow perspective, obviously, which is why we have a now bucket and we're not pulling money out of equities in a one year time frame. Um, so just something to keep in mind when it comes to this bucketing from a time frame perspective of now, soon and later, why do you guys have one in two years? Why is it three to nine years? Why is it 10 years plus that we don't get till later money is because at 10 years is where we can with a very, very high degree of certainty say, okay, we're good. Um, we've got a 99% chance basically that if we stick with equities and we let them write out that we're going to be in a positive position. Whereas anything less than that, as you guys can see on the chart, anything in red, we have too big of a chance of failure. And so we need to put some sort of guardrails up or buffers up. Yeah. All right. Um, question number seven, I'm going to leave that up there because we're going to come back to that. So I'm going to go to question number seven. At Fiat, we always recommend our retired clients have at least one year of cash on hand, but in most cases suggest two is even better. Why? The vast majority of you said all of the above. Uh, those three things were behaviorally, the additional cash will keep more people invested in volatile markets. Uh, statistically, two years dramatically decreases the odds of losing money in the markets. And three, more flexibility for unexpected expenses that arise. You guys nailed this one. 55% of you said all of the above, and that is correct. And so let's walk through every one of those. The behavior aspect, Matt, is probably the hardest part of our job. Yep. Uh, getting people to set the emotions aside and actually act in a logical way, a math way, uh, however you want to put that. It, it's really, really hard when it comes to money. Uh, in fact, one of the... <laughs> There's this, there's a gentleman in our industry that has a company called Behavior Gap, and I follow him. He's got great stuff. And he's got a print that his most favorite, like he does all these drawings. And his most famous drawing that you see everywhere is just a pen of, and it says money equals feelings. Uh, and it's true. And so having a little extra cash on hand behaviorally really helps people stick to the course and stick to the plan. Uh, the second one there, statistically, two years dramatically decreases the odds of losing money in the market. So if you look back at this chart that I'm sharing with you, take a peek at this. Look at one year. In a one-year time frame, you have a 26% chance that you're going to come out a loser and a 74% chance that you're going to come out a winner. Now, day by day in the markets, it's almost 50-50. Like if you look at one day, if you're going to get in the market every single day, it's about a coin flip. Over one year, your odds increase dramatically to about 74% chance of success. 26% chance of failure. If we go to two years, we go all the way from a 26% chance down to 17. But look what happens if we have even more cash on hand and we start to over-insure our cash. We go to three years or five years, we go from 17 to 16, that's not a lot. And we lose a whole year worth of cash just kind of sitting there doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And if we go all the way to five years, we add even two more years on top of that, we go from 16 to 13. It doesn't really add a ton of value. And so this again comes down to just trying to find efficiencies of, Anytime you want liquidity and safety, you give up return. And so you got to try to find that line of, well, where am I giving up too much liquidity and safety to chase return versus where am I giving up too much return to chase safety and liquidity? And that's where these bucketing uh, diversification of time comes into play. Anything want to add to that? If anyone can count the number of times we said buckets today, you will get a free t-shirt. <laughs> Free t-shirt. We have t-shirts. Oh, we do have t-shirts. <laughs> I thought you were making promises we couldn't keep. It's not a fiat t-shirt. We're just going to go buy it from. I don't think anyone counted. All right. Uh, question. All right. That was the last like legit question. Legit we have, question. we have one more question in here. Let's see. I don't even, I haven't looked to see which one. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. All right. Matt. 
I'm about 90% confident I know the answer to this one. So Brad's going to chime in. <laughs> what animal species is considered the smartest? So 55% of you selected bottlenose dolphin. 3%, geez, poor parrot, selected <laughs> African gray parrot. 23% selected elephant. And 19% selected orangutan. I believe the correct answer is orangutan. It is. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So we, we stumped you again. We did. Um, we always put a fun question at the end and we looked this up and we were wrong. Matt, what did you guess was the smartest pit, smartest, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the smartest animal. Pig. He said pig. And pigs are on the top 10, uh, but they're not even in the top five. Number five was African gray parrot. Uh, Bottlenose dolphin is number two. I think the elephant was three. Uh, the orangutan was number one. So smartest animal out there. Uh, and the smartest animal out there would probably diversify not only by investments, but by time <laughs> and, tax. and taxes. Uh, at the end of the day, you guys, and we talked about this in a uh, recent uh, podcast that we did in that Psychology of Money podcast. And it's becoming more and more a part of the conversation we're having with our the families that we work with here at Fiat. But this idea of retirement and what we do for our clients and this model that we have of we teach our clients how to spend their money, uh, just understand something that your generation, if you're in that 55 plus crowd, that 55 to 75, kind of that baby boomer generation, you're trailblazers. You're redefining this whole idea of retirement and the things that you guys are doing uh, relative to retire the day you retire, how long you're living, the world that we live in today. Uh, it's never happened before. We've never, financial advisors like Matt and I from the, hit, the beginning of time have never had to deal with what we're dealing with today. Financial advisors have always helped clients try to grow their pile of money or try to end their life with dignity in some way, shape or form. Uh, but there's never been this 20 to 30 year period where people aren't working and have to live off of a pile of money that they save themselves. And so a lot of these things that we're talking to you about uh, and the math behind these concepts really is new data over the last 10, 15 years mm -hmm. or so, uh, studying the appropriate way to spend money. Right. Uh, and so it's really, really important that these three things that we talked about today are part of your plan. But it's also really important for a firm like ours to kind of stay on top of this stuff, because again, it's not like we have 150 years of history or something like that to go off of to try to plan appropriately uh, from not just a behavioral perspective and plans that clients can stick with, but from a numbers perspective and make sure we're being cognizant of all of the gotchas or risks out there for retirees today. Yeah. These uh, three being some of the biggest. <clears throat> uh, just one more thing I'd like to add. Uh, as part of the notes that I jotted down, we'll talk about this a lot in our podcasts and especially digging into the behavioral side of things. But what year was the 401k invented? Do you have any idea? Uh, 1980. Yes. So yes, we just assume it's been around all, all along. You know, us especially because throughout our entire career, it's been there. But that's a, that's a very, very nice job, by the way. <laughs> it's a very small sliver of time when we look at the long term. You know what year the Roth IRA was invented? 97. Yeah, nice. Again, that's not very long at all. I'm an orangutan. Nice job, nice job Brad. <laughs> so in our mind, we assume this is just how it's always been. This is how we approach things. But in reality, it's a very, very short period of time. So yeah. um, just going back to the behavioral side of things, reiterating the importance of building frameworks, having those mental models, and sticking to them. So, I, uh, You know what's funny about the questions you were asking is this was a, this was going to be a quiz question for us because when it comes to taxes and you think about retirement accounts in America, there we looked this up in like 2020, uh, there was like 34.8 billion or some trillion trillion, trillion uh, assets in retirement accounts. Now that includes IRAs, 401ks, defined contribution plans, defined benefit plans, uh, state uh, state retirement plans, things of that nature. But in total, almost $35 trillion in 2020 socked away in these plans that as you, the average American person that's got money in these plans starts to pull it out is all taxed. To put that into perspective, in 2020, the entire budget for the United States, the federal budget was 4.79 trillion. 35 trillion in these accounts, 4.79 trillion budget to make the entire United States run the way that it runs. Uh, Congress knows, <laughs> 
what I just told you. And they know that eventually all of that money has to come out. And they know that the baby boomers are this basketball moving garden hose that is our economy. And so that's why every time Congress meets, you hear about tons of potential changes as it relates to taxes in retirement uh, is because <laughs> they know any small tweak on that pile of money, 30 set, $35 trillion dollars is going to make a large impact into the income that they've got coming in the door. And so again, I'm not gonna predict the future and say what they're going to do, but it is a risk to everybody that's got money sitting in a bucket that's never been taxed in the fact that there's more dry powder sitting in your retirement accounts than anywhere else in our economy. And uh, again, we know that, which means that they know that, and it's just something we need to plan for. Yeah. I was really positive new to leave you, leave you guys with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to predict some future though. Okay. You're going to watch some baseball this week and I'm going to watch some soccer. That's true. All right. That's true. Go. Yep. We've got, uh, we've got baseball going on tonight actually and tomorrow night and the next <laughs> night. So same, same here. All right. Got, guys and gals. Uh, we are back next month, uh, July 26th, 27th, whatever I told you at the beginning of the workshop today. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the volatility of the markets. And so join us for that. If I've, if you didn't know, you can invite your friends and family to this. We are more than happy. At the end of the day, it's a Zoom meeting. I don't care if there's one person on here, 100 people on here, or 500 people on here. Uh, we just love doing this. And so if you know people uh, that you care about or that you love, that you think would benefit from the type of education that we do here at Fiat, we would, we would genuinely, genuinely appreciate uh, having them be a part of what we do. So the only thing we need from them is where to send the invite. We just need an email address. We can send them the invite to the inner circle workshop. So please, uh, invite your friends and family. We'd love to have them be a part of our inner circle, uh, and enjoy some of this education that we deliver. So with that said, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks for joining us for June's inner circle workshop. Make sure you have it. Ah, nice. <laughs> See you guys. Thank you.